morning, hello, and welcome to our webinar. The theme for today is Time to Grow Precision Farming with Data. My name is Priyash, co-founder of the Awareness Company, and we are coming to you live from a brisk Pretoria this morning. We hope today's session is going to shed light on data for the agricultural value chain. Whether you're a farmer or an agribusiness, it's really important to start to utilize and understand how data can benefit you into your future, into the operations, and into your business going forward. We have an amazing lineup of speakers and an awesome live panel later today in the session going forward. So feel free to engage in the chat box. Please send questions, comments. Um, we'll answer them later during our panel session. So we're kicking right off with our first speaker, Estelle Luber. Estelle is my co-founder of the Awareness Company as well. And we're starting off from the basics, from the beginning. What do you consider when you want to invest in agricultural technology? So let's hear from Estelle. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Like Praj mentioned, I'm going to be highlighting some of the key things that you need to consider when investing in technology. We're starting off with the first thing you need to ask yourself. Is your farming business ready for technology? This relates to what is your technology strategy? What do you want to improve? <laughs> what do you want to improve in your business with technology? And how does it relate to your overall farming strategy? Also, do you have budget for it? Here I want you to consider not only the budget that you will need to actually procure the technology, but also how it will disrupt your operations and what will that initial cost be for its adoption. Talking about adoption. Adoption on a business level. This is an equally important point, but it's also very critical to get right. If there isn't buy-in from your business decision makers on the farm, um, then you're probably setting yourself up for failure. The technology needs to provide value to all stakeholders within your farm, and it needs to get advocated from the top down to make sure that it will be adopted successfully, but also to make sure that you'll get the full benefit from the technology that you procure. Next, we're looking at your farm itself. Here, I want to highlight two aspects. Firstly, the infrastructure on your farm, and secondly, your people. Infrastructure-wise, do you have a good, stable internet connection? I cannot stress the importance of this point enough. In fact, I think I can easily do an entire talk on just why you need a good internet connection somewhere on your farm. Most tech today already uses internet in some manner, um, whether it is to operate or whether it is to allow you to analyze its data. And when we're looking at the future of farming, research has shown that next generation precision agriculture technologies will actually rely on a good stable internet connection on a wide area of your farm. This is to increase your productivity, increase your processes, reduce your input, and um, improve your access to market. Next, we need to consider other connectivity that you already have on your farm or connectivity that you need to deploy. Now, here I'm talking mostly about the IoT networks on your farm, the LoRa's and the SIGFOX. These low band, wide range networks allow sensors to send information, tiny packages of information very frequently on your farm. Devices that run on these um, networks can easily last for years on the same batteries, which makes it excellent for agricultural use cases. These networks, as well as the devices, have their own pros and cons. Um, so when you do decide to invest in rolling out one of these networks, it is important to also consider your future technology plans and what other devices you want to deploy in future so that you get the most return on your investment. It's also worth mentioning that you do have some power over bettering your cell phone connectivity on your farm. It can't hurt to ask your suppliers whether they can either better it or roll out cell phone connectivity for the farming area where your farm is in. With cell phone connectivity comes a whole range of benefits. Uh, internet on your farm is probably one of the biggest ones, but there's also a whole range of devices and sensors that run on the GSM network. 
Just on a side note when it comes to the connectivity, in an ideal world, you do want to have access to all of these connectivity options on your farm to make sure that you can choose the best device to solve your problem. But unfortunately, that comes at a cost right now. So that is why it is really, really important that when you do decide to deploy one of these networks, to make sure that it aligns best with what you're trying to achieve. Next on the infrastructure side, I quickly want to touch on electricity. Depending on what technology you want to deploy on your farm, you might need electricity or power somewhere on the farm where you don't have access to electricity currently. Here you need to consider the different options available. Solar, generators for example. Exactly how much power you'll need for that technology solution, but also think about how much power you'll need in future and whether that solution can scale with your future requirements. You also need to consider um, the maintenance on these solutions. For example, with solar, you need to replace the batteries at some point. So you need to budget and plan for that. And lastly, unfortunately, you need to consider how you will keep the equipment safe from theft. Then, coming to the second part of your farm, your people. Yes, here we're talking about people adoption again, uh, adoption of the technology, adoption of the processes as well that comes with the technology, but more importantly also the training and upskilling that your employees will need and possibly even the fact that you will need to employ someone that has a specific skill set um, that you'll need to make this technology work for you. Um, they need to understand the value of the technology, how it will work, the maintenance, its limitations. But very importantly for adoption, they need to understand what value that technology will bring to your farm and also what value it will bring to them. This will increase your chances of success with adoption. It will also increases, um, increase the return on investment you get from your investment. All right. Next, we're looking at return on investment and how you measure that. Now, this is very important, um, something that you really need to consider before you start investing in the technology that you're looking at. Measuring return on investment can be very hard, especially because it can indirectly influence so many aspects on your farm. It is, however, important to try and do it and set goals beforehand. Some of the things I want you to try and quantify are, how much money can you save? How much more efficient do you get from your workers? Um, how much more efficient will your processes be? How much time will you save? What insights will you get from your technology solution that you didn't have previously? So how will it help you make better decisions on your farm? Also, how will you grow and improve? How will you grow your operations? How will you improve, for example, your quality? How will the quality of your crops improve when you use this technology? How long will you get benefit from this technology? Some technologies have a lifespan. Then, very importantly, how will you improve your environmental sustainability? For example, how much less water will you use? And lastly, how will you improve or how will it contribute to the sustainability of your farming business? All right, so now you have your goals. Um, you understand what you want to get back from the technology in terms of return. How do you choose your tech provider? I think this is probably the most difficult aspect for a farmer. And this is also where we see the costly mistakes are being made. Two of the most common mistakes that we have seen is that farmers feel that they do not know enough about technology and they end up not doing enough research to make their decision well. Farmers also put their blind trust in specific providers or even a specific person. A cousin with half an engineering degree hacking something together in the garage with years of headaches, technology debt and rework after rework. Really common mistake that we're finding. We always urge farmers to do their research. Once you know what you are looking for, the outputs and the ROI goals that we just talked about, your research will be much more focused and you will easily get a list of possible supplies that can help you with your problem. Once you have that list, it is important to not get misled by shiny pictures and the world's best marketing and sales teams. Ask for demonstrations, ask for, um, for testimonials. Try and understand the technical capability of 
your suppliers and your, um, um, what they will bring for you, whether they are resellers or whether they actually produce the solution. For some resellers, um, oh, for some, uh, some of the resellers will actually come with great benefits. For example, if you have local support for international hardware that you want to buy. In other cases, you want to deal directly with the company that is producing the solution that you're looking at because you need that flexibility and you want your feedback to get put into the next version of the solution. For software specifically, you need to understand what you are going to get. Is it going to be a CD that you install on one PC that never gets updated again? You really do not want that. Or is it a service provider that's going to continuously deploy updates, um, have great innovation, and grow along with your business? Software also needs to, get easy, um, needs to be easy to use. For hardware, you need to make sure that it is um, built to withstand the harsh environments that come with the agriculture domain. You also need to understand the lifetime of the hardware, and you're going to need to understand the maintenance of the hardware. For example, you need to maybe change batteries. How often do you need to change the batteries? And when you do that, where will you find those batteries, and what will the cost be? As a conclusion, I would like to remind everyone that it's always important to start small. Test whatever you want to deploy on one or two use cases first before you start spending a lot of money rolling it all out, out, um, out all over your farm. And lastly, I urge everyone to not be afraid to ask for advice. You might think that your problem is very unique, but chances are that you um, will encounter someone that has a similar problem or exactly the same problem that you have that they're already solving with technology or trying to solve with technology. Ask for advice from farmers, ask for advice from technology companies. Even if the technology company does not provide exactly the solution that you have, chances are that they might be able to, to point you in the right direction and give you an outside view. So to summarize, Make sure your farming business, as well as your farm, is ready for technology. Define your return and investment goals beforehand. Do your research to choose the correct providers that will walk the journey with you. Start small and test, and don't be afraid to ask for advice. Thank you, everyone, for your time. I hope these guidelines will help you um, with your next technology adventure. Thank you so much, Estelle. Uh, that was awesome. I'm always, always inspired by my co-founder's passion for agriculture. And what she said is so vital. Please consider all of these considerations when you want to invest in technology itself. Um, the next talk will be by myself. And I'm going to say, OK, farmers around the world asking themselves, I have all of this data. Now what do I do with it? So, now you've invested in agriculture technology. You've made that decision. Uh, what next? What comes next? So let's jump straight in into it. So I'll be talking to you today about using data for farm security and precision farming itself. So what I want to highlight is that data is so abundant nowadays. Technology is so abundant. But how do we actually utilize this for agriculture for your farming, for your operations uh, going forward. But the first thing that we want to highlight at this moment is let's all get on the same page in terms of our definitions. What is agricultural security? What is precision agriculture itself? And I think if we start from that basis, we're starting from the correct basis. So agricultural security is about reducing a loss of income and keeping your family and business safe. That is the fundamental of what agricultural security is when we talk about farm security, last mile delivery, uh, and, and ensuring uh, those components. And precision agriculture is about reducing risk, maximizing quality and profit. It is only once we agree on those definitions that we can move forward and say, OK, how is technology and data actually going to help me? That is the fundamentals that we must start from. So now we have data. 
What is it good for? From our view, absolutely everything. So there is four key components that I want to run through you when it comes to data. And the first one is probably the most vital one. It gives you awareness and visibility as to what's going on. Whether it's on your farm, on your processing plant, in your pack house, in your agricultural business, in your grain storage, in your insurance company itself, that is one of the most fundamentals what data gives you, that awareness and a visibility as to what's going on on a continuous basis. Now, what it also allows you is the visibility and allows you to share that awareness within your agricultural value chain. And what I mean by that is, if you are on a farm uh, itself, you have your farm workers, you have your suppliers, you have your off-takers. So data now gives that continuous visibility across your agricultural value chain. If you're an insurance company providing insurance to the farmers, the visibility then is back to you and to the farmers that you are supplying inputs to, whether it's financing, feed, fertilizer, and so forth. So that is the first fundamental of data, awareness and visibility. The second one is that data gives you a deeper understanding as to what's going on. And as we improve our understanding going forward, we tend to then understand our unique situations, our unique challenges, our unique problems within our agricultural business, be it farming, or if you're an input supplier, uh, as I explained. Now, often we make decisions based on experience, based on gut, and that is great. But what data gives you is it allows you to enhance, elevate, and grow. That is uh, your experience and your gut and your instinct decisions. It, gives, it removes that uncertainty. Uh, so you, you, you take away this, OK, I think this is going to happen. But data then solidifies that understanding. Now, once you have awareness and understanding, and data helps you with that, then the natural thing that happens next is better decisions. And everyone, everyone in all businesses, you know, is after better decisions. We always reflect on a decision we made, and in retrospect, in hindsight, it seems obvious. Now, this is the thing data can actually help us uncover helping to make better decisions. And the awareness, understanding, better decisions then lead to better actions. And actions are so vital. Yes, we cannot uh, predict everything. But the actions that I speak of is, if something is happening right now, I'm able to act on it. If something has already happened, I'm able to better react towards it. And then you want to start moving towards becoming proactive. And I think proactivity is one of the number one goals in agriculture. There is so many variables and uncertain conditions, whether it's climate or increasing prices. Uh, th there's so much to consider. But data can help us shape and predict and anticipate that future. So that is the fundamentals of what data can give you. Uh, in an agricultural context, uh, let's look at uh, some examples. So you want to compare your historic yield, and you want to use current sensor data to help you understand what your next year's crops should be, as an example. Data can help you understand when will the next drought likely occur. Um, am I overwatering my crops? Where did the thief or criminals enter and exit my farm? Are there any patterns or trends that are coming out from my data itself? These are the type of things that data can really, really help you uncover and go deeply into it uh, going forward. So at the awareness company, one of the things we strive to do is figure out the ways to best work with data itself. So our view is that we've created a product that fits across the entire agricultural value chain, a product for the farmer, for the farm, for the agribusiness for agri-input suppliers, for off-takers. And the reason why we've taken such a wide view is because we truly believe that data has a role to play across the entire value chain. It's not just for the farmer. It's not just for the agribusiness. It's not just for the large uh, entities and institutions itself. It's for everyone, and that's really, really important. So what we've created is a product that is completely data agnostic. So we 
take data from sensors, from people on the ground, from different systems, we aggregate it, we push it together, and we provide for agricultural security patterns and trends. Now this is important. The patterns and trends give us the historic view of what's happening. We want to reduce false detections. How many times have you been woken up uh, abruptly at night uh, for no reason itself? Uh, and you're on edge all the time. So data and this technology can actually help you sleep better at night, as an example. Uh, and then it gives you early warning on threats. So that now starts to help us be proactive. We start getting early warning from all of this data. Then it starts to help benefit us in, in massive ways. Uh, and then from the precision agriculture perspective, of course, top of mind, everyone wants to save costs. Uh, and we want operational efficiency, and we want to learn how to elevate and grow our businesses going forward. And data also helps you automate all of your reporting admin uh, going forward. But let's, let's be a little bit more practical. I, I now want to show you two very simple examples of how data actually looks. So what you're looking at at the moment is Hydra itself. And you'll see on the left where the mouse cursor is, you know, you get your alerts from your devices in the field that's deployed. You get information that's being logged. So here we're looking at a suspicious finding. You can see the exact location of it. You can click and have more detail. This is all data that's being visualized. We're so used to using other systems like social networks and so forth. But how about one that's for our farming operations, for our farming businesses? Here we're looking at a suspicious vehicle that was created. You can have media, images, evidence that you can look at in as much detail. Now a lot of these conversations are happening on WhatsApp groups or there's a phone call reaction when something happens. But here now there's a thread of information that one can follow, uh, any other information, any updates on the information that has come through. And it allows a wider farming community to say, okay, we are now in this together from a security point of view. You know, let's be aware together and try to solve these problems uh, from a community basis. Uh, another input into the security component, what you're looking at now is live tracking of cattle, as an example. So these are GPS, uh, GPS collars, sorry, that are mounted on the cattle itself. And you're seeing the movements in real time. So if the cattle is unrestful or if he jumps out of a boundary, a camp or anything, immediately a farmer gets an alert. This again allows them to become proactive. Uh, in that. Now, why we love technology so much is that this specific application is for security, but looking at the movement of cattle uh, helps understanding grazing patterns, and now we're seeing the overlap between precision farming, and there's so much more examples like that. So when we talk about security itself, cameras are always top of mind, and we believe that camera's value is on the intelligence you place onto the cameras. So here is the buzzword artificial intelligence that allows you to scan and detect things within the images of the camera, be it vehicles, humans, or animals. How often have you been woken up by a porcupine at 12 o'clock at night? So the whole idea is here, wake me up if there's a vehicle or a, a person when there shouldn't be one at a certain period of night. And so this is one very, very basic simplified example of, you know, what does agricultural security look like when we talk about data itself? The next example that I want to show you is more on the precision agricultural stuff. So you'll see on the left now your social feed of information that's coming through from people on the ground, whether it's weeding, planting, harvesting, uh, you're looking at soil analysis, water analysis, cattle births. It's really, really up to the, your context and if you're farming and your agribusiness. But all of this information now is coming through visible in real time for you. Then you can also monitor things that are on your farm, whether it's movement of people, movement of your equipment, movement of your vehicles. That allows you to see things in real time. Um, how long does someone harvest? How long does someone plant? And then we combine all of this with the sensors and devices that are in the market uh, themselves. And now you can see the detail of this, whether it's electroconductivity or soil analysis, you really start to get the benefits out from a farming perspective. And then you want to compare this with, for example, satellite-based monitoring, your NDVI analysis. So what you combine your NDVI analysis 
with the sensor data to start to validate all of that. So again, you gotta validate and utilize data for the best possible and don't rely on one source of data. This is why we fundamentally aggregate a lot of different types of data into one view so that you can have a holistic view and it starts telling you different stories as we call it about the data uh, going forward. So again, very simplified examples, the examples uh, on livestock, on citrus growers, on pack houses, uh, really commodity independent. Uh, but today I just wanted to give you a, a, a simplified view of what's going on there. So where do we see the future of data going? Uh, and for us, fundamentally, sensors are becoming smarter, smaller, cheaper. Uh, connectivity is becoming more available, uh, and it is getting easier now to deploy connectivity on, on farms in, in, in areas where traditionally there wasn't a lot of connectivity uh, going forward. But really, fundamentally, in our minds, how we see the future of data is in being able to tell a story from your data across the past, across the present, across the future. The, what we want to see happen is that your technology allows you to ask any question on your data. Tell me what happened on my farm in this past week. Give me the frost prediction outlook over the next three months. Where can I optimize my operations on my farm? And even taking that one step further, we want the technology to give you any answer without you having to even ask the question. And really, this is the vision that we have. It should be simple, simple for everyone to use. And with the right support, the right team we have here, we believe we can uh, see, see that vision come true. And we hope a lot of companies adopt this methodology going forward as well. So the future of agriculture and data itself, we want to get to a, a stage where, just like how equipment and machinery is part and parcel of your agricultural operations, uh, we want data to be part uh, from day one, uh, embedded into the way you're working in your agricultural business. And there's a strong overlap between the security components and the precision agricultural components. Um, they say, you know, there's, there's uh, going to be a lot of people to feed into the future, 20 billion or 10 billion or so, they say, in 2030. Um, and, and there's a lot of room for optimization. And this is really where we feel data itself can actually help uh, agriculture move forward in a positive direction. So thank you so much for listening to, uh, to me today on uh, using data for precision farming and agricultural security going forward. My name is Tebo Honyatela. I am the founder and CEO of Farmers Hope. Farmers Hope is a mixed farm that is based in the village called Komo Komo in Northwest. We do mixed vegetables, we do sweet peppers, jalapeno, spinach and tomatoes. Currently we are using Hydra. Uh, it is very useful because they have installed the trap camera for us. Uh, then it helps us to monitor any movements around the farm because sometimes we experience theft and we also have an app that we use. It helps us to monitor the environment and also for tracking the expenses. We are excited to use the app because it has so many features that we can use because normally we were just doing things manually. You know, we were just writing on a paper and we didn't even know how much are our expenses, how much is our loss, you know, how much profit we are making. So we are very excited to use all the features because we can also do the rain gauge. We can monitor the rain, how much rain we're experiencing. I'm excited about the feature that is coming in the future. It will help us with frost prediction, then we will know when the frost is coming so that we can you know, be ready and prepare so that we don't get affected by the frost. We really need mentors, honestly, in farming all the time because at times we get attacked by some diseases. So if you don't have a mentor, it's a serious problem. So in farming, you really need somebody that you can, uh, who can mentor you. When you have a problem, you know, you can just quickly uh, send a picture 
and tell him the kind of disease that you are experiencing, then you know what kind of uh, chemicals you should use on time. Because otherwise, if you don't have a mentor, you know, you, you cannot even be commercial and profitable. So mentorship is very important. Wow, that's really, really great to see Hydra being used uh, on the farm itself. And, and this fundamentally is why we're in, we in agriculture, you know, about contributing to food security. And we truly believe that uh, smallholder farmers has been an underserved market when it comes to technology and deployments. Um, and this fundamentally really drives us uh, going forward. And, and really why educational sessions like this one is, and community building is so important uh, going forward. So next up, we have Neil Kemp from Senves. Neil is going to discuss how to interpret market trends and pricing going forward. Please don't forget to leave your questions and comments uh, in the chat box. Uh, let's hear from Neil. Good day, my name is Neil Kemp. I'm from Senves and I'm here today to speak to you about how to interpret market trends and pricing. We're gonna start very, very basically and then we're gonna take it from there and try to, to put a little bit of fat on it. Uh, let's start. The first thing a farmer has to deal with is, we're now in December, the price is 4,000 rand, and we have not yet uh, harvested our maize. We're only harvesting our maize in July. But the price is, is 4,000 rand. We want to use that price. How do we do that? Now we've, we've, we've done nothing. We have not used that price because we don't know how to use that price. And we are now in July, and the price is 2,237 Rand. That's a big fall. The thing is, we did sell our grain now in July for the highest price in July, but it's only 2,237 Rand. The difference in price there is 1,836 Rand. That's a big difference. That's that, that tractor that you want, that is that implement that you wanted to buy. That is maybe next year's um, uh, uh, fertilizer that you want to buy. So what can we do to take that, to get that 4,000 Rand price and not have to take the 2,237 Rand price? So how do we get that maximum price? The answer is a future contract. So how does a future contract work? Let's start with suffix. This is a trading platform. This is Swordfish. This is a trading platform that we use at Sinves for our trading. You can see on, on the screen, we have a white maize, yellow maize, sunflower, wheat, and soya beans. And, and on the left side, you will see all the different months that you can trade on. If we go into a little bit more detail uh, on the suffix screen, you will see if we take only white maize, you can see on the first, in the first column, we have all our expiries. That is our future months that we have there. So we have July, September, December, March. We usually have a May contract there also, and then we have a Ju the July next year contract. That's our main contracts. Between those contracts, we have spot months contracts. That's where we do spots selling. The next to that, it's, it just, uh, the next column, it tells us it's white maize, so we know what the commodity is. Then you see a price B and a price A there. The price B is where the buyers want to buy. It's a price that the buyer wants to buy at. And the price A is the pr price that the seller wants to sell at. Next to them, you see the quantity B, quantity A. That is how um, the, the number of contracts that that buyer wants to buy at that price. If we move on, we'll see the last price. That's the last price that matched between buyer and seller there. So that's the last price that went through. Then we have to change for a day. Then we have the, last, the time that last trade went through. We have the high for the day, we have the low for the day, and we have the volume that has gone through it today. Then next to it, we have the mark to market, that M to M is our mark to market. Well, only what the mark to market is, it was yesterday's mark, market price that the, the market closed at. Uh, and then you'll see an open interest. Now, open interest is that, um, 
is the number of contracts that have matched between a buyer and a seller. So the open interest is where is the number of contracts that has been uh, done between buyers and sellers at the moment. Then we have the percentage change, and then we just have a uh, description of the contract. Now at the bottom of that, you'll see a depth screen. Now a depth screen is just if you if you go into July and you can see who is the buyers, who is the sellers on that screen. You'll see on the left side, it's our buyers and the different levels they are willing to pay and the, the amount of contracts that they want at that level. The green you will see that is Invest that is buying and selling there. On, on, the, on the right hand side, you'll see this Invest trying to sell at 4,268 Rand. Now let's look a little more in detail about uh, a suffix contract. The market, uh, suffix market, it opens at nine o'clock and it closes at 12 o'clock. So if you want to hedge or sell your grain, you have to do it between nine and 12. If you call two minutes past 12, it's too late. You have to go and wait for till the next day. If we look at a different type of contract, we have white maize, yellow maize, soybeans, sunflowers, and wheat. The contracts have different sizes. If you take white maize and yellow maize, we have the contract size is 100 tons. Swear beans is 50 tons. Sunflower and wheat are also 50 tons. Then we have daily limits. So within a day, the market can move 130 rand on a, on a white maize and a yellow maize contract. That means if the market goes up, it limits it that day to a 130 rand move. That is just to put it to, to make risk a little bit less. Um, on soybeans, that, that the market can move at 220 rand a day. Sunflower also 220, and then wheat can move 190 um, rands a day. That is the normal daily limit. If the market moves uh, that limit for two days, then we get an extended limit. Then for two days, if the market goes to that extended limit, it, it can go to 195 for white maize, 330 rand for uh, soybean and sunflower, and 285 rand for wheat. So if we get two days of uh, daily limits that goes to that limit, then we get extended limits. If we get extended limits for two days, then we get an open market. It, the price can move anywhere in that day. We have, in 22 years, I've never seen that the market did uh, the two days of extended limits and then just uh, went wild after that. It normally, the market just reigns in from there and nobody wants that risk. Why do we use suffix? Why don't they invest just buy your grain and why don't a buyer just buy your grain and keep that grain? Let me explain it to you. Before we go, now, go on, can we just look at these two definitions? What is a long position? What is a short position? Because I'm going to reference that a lot in the uh, next few uh, slides. A long position is actually very, very simple. It's just when you've bought grain or you own grain, you have a long position. You are long in the market. A short position is when you have sold grain, then on the market, so you're short grain. So that's the only difference. When you've bought grain or you own grain, you're long in the market. And when you have sold grain on the market, you are short grain. Now, if you look at that, a farmer is always long grain. That is the interesting part. Even if you're just thinking about planting, you have uh, maize on the, on, on the field, or you have maize in the silo, you have a long position already. So if you think you're not a trader, you are actually a trader because you have that long position. That's why you have all those emotions when you have to sell. You have, you have the same emotions as a trader because you're always long grain. But what do, you do, what do we do with that long position? So we have to go and sell that long position. How does that look? If we look at the sell, this is a short position. So just to explain the graph to you, um, on the top side, we have our profit. On the bottom side, we have our loss. Then we have our price movement, say from 3,000 to 5,000. Um, uh, we have our price movement. So if the price, if today the price is 4,000 Rand and you sell without a long position, you just do a sell on the market. 
tomorrow, if the price moves up, you're going to lose money. If the price goes down, you're going to make money. The same with the um, long position. If you have a long position today, the price is 4,000 Rand. If the price goes up tomorrow, you're going to make money. If the price goes down tomorrow, you're going to get less for your grain. So you're going to have less money. So if we go and combine those two, so now you have your long position, you, what do you have to do to fix your price, to hedge your price? You are going to have to go and get a short position. And that's where you go to suffix and you sell your grain on suffix to get that short position. So how does your position look now? Like that. So you go and you lock in that 4,000 Rand that you're happy with. You can go and lock it in in December for July. So in December, the price is 4,000 Rand. You go on suffix, you lock in that price for July. And now it doesn't matter what happened through the year. In July, you will get 4,000 Rand for your maize. So that's how it looks graphically. So um, there's no movement anymore. If the price goes up, you'll still get 4,000 Rand. If the price goes down, you'll still get 4,000 Rand. So now you're fixed for July. So that is how you lock in that 4,000 Rand. But it's not as simple as that. We can do another strategy. That is a, a strategy that you do with a put option. Now, a put option, I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to try to explain it to you very simply in the next, in the next slide. Let's, let's try that. So the definition of a put of, of a option is an option is a financial derivative that gives the buyer the right, you listen, the right, but not the obligation to buy or sell an underlying asset at the agreed upon price and date. Okay, I'm going to dumb it down for you right now. A premium is what you pay for an option. The strike price is the price at we, where you, d you do the option. And then we have in the money and out of the money. Now that simply is if you buy an option and the strike price is at the market price, you're at the money. If that uh, option moves into the money and you make, some, you make money, then it's in the money. And if it moves where you don't make money, it's out of the money. It's, it's simple like that. When you buy an option, it's like you're buying insurance. Say the option costs you, the premium is 200 Rand, it costs you 200 Rand. You're, you're gonna buy insurance for 200 Rand to do sell your grain at 4,000 Rand. So if we take the 4,000 Rand that you're gonna sell your grain at, we take the 200 Rand that you pay for that, that right, but not that obligation, then you're effectively putting a minimum price of 3,800 Rand that you can sell your grain at. So that is your worst case scenario. Now, if you look at that combination of that long position that you have, remember you, you, your long grain, with that uh, put that you buy, now the put could cost you 200 Rand, so you can see there, it costs us 200 Rand for a 4,000 Rand put. If, so effectively, we have a 3,800 Rand minimum price. Now the nice thing about a put, if the market moves up from there, so we're at 4,000 Rand, at 4,100, at 4,200, we are breaking even, we are getting our 200 Rand back, and from there on upwards, we, we share in that um, upward movement, which is nice. Uh, so if the market goes to 5,000 Rand, we can just decide to sell our grain at 5,000 Rand. We don't have to use our put that gives us our, our, minimum, con our minimum price. We don't have to use it. Only thing we have to do is we have to pay the 200 Rand to the person who sold us that put. So we, do, we can get the 5,000 Rand price, but remember we still have to pay the seller so we give him his 200 Rand, so we have a 4,800 Rand price then. So that's the nice thing about a put. It gives us our minimum price, but it allows us to take part in the market if the price goes up. The next contract we have to look at is a minimum maximum price contract. Now what is nice about this contract is, an option can at times be very expensive. So we, have to, we want to sometimes take a little bit of that cost off. So we use a minimum maximum price contract. The nice thing about this contract is we're still long grain. 
we go and we buy a put option at the money, which gives us our minimum price. Then, to make this cheaper, we go and sell a call out of the money. So we go and buy a, a put at say 4,000 Rand, we go and sell a, a call at 4,500 Rand. What this gives us, it costs us 200 Rand for the put, but the call, because we sell it, gives us 100 Rand. Now our whole strategy only costs us 100 Rand, which makes it much more affordable. The downside to this is, when we reach uh, 4,500 Rand, that is the maximum price that we can get, less the, four, the, less the 100 Rand. So our maximum price can be 4,400 Rand, but our minimum price can be 3,900 Rand, not 3,800 Rand, as when we did only a put. So that makes this, this strategy a little bit better, uh, but we only use it in cer certain circumstances. I'm going to get to that a little bit later. You're sitting there now thinking, okay, when do I use what? When do I use the fixed price contract? When do I use the minimum price contract? When do I use the minimum maximum price contract? Let's, 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 let's take it step by step. So the fixed price contract, that's very nice. You have the long position. Now you're happy with the price. I can pay everything with that. I'm happy with that. I can, put, I can pay all my input costs with that. I can buy that new tractor. I'm happy with that. Then you can go and just do a fixed price contract and just go and sell that on the market. Just remember, if you do that for fixed price contract, you'll be obligated to deliver that grain, that physical grain uh, on that contract. If you can't, we're going to talk about the risks right now. The minimum price contract, you have a long position and you have bought a put option. When do we use that? We use it when we think, um, I'm happy with the price where it is now, but the market may move higher. Or you're not sure if you were able to physically deliver the grain. So now you only have that 200 Rand risk. If you can't deliver that grain, you only have to pay that premium. Our minimum maximum price contract, when do we use that? It's your long position, you've bought that put at the money, you've sold that call out of the money. When do we use it? We use it when we, we, we are sure we're going to have the grain, that's the one thing. You believe the market is near its top and you want to pay less for that strategy. So you, you want to get that minimum price, you're happy with a little bit movement to the top if you, if you can get it, but you want to pay less for that strategy and you must be sure you have that grain. Okay, what is the risk of these contracts? Now, fixed price contract, the risk is you have that long position and you have sold the future. So if you take away that long position, you've only now just sold a future. Now, what happens to a sold future? We've looked at that graph. If the price goes higher on a sold future, then you are losing money. So if you can't deliver that grain, you're going to have to buy out that contract. So you sold it for 4,000, the, the market goes up to, up to 4,500 Rand, you are going to have to pay 500 Rand to get out of that contract. So what we do at Synvest, we take it in increments and we hedge in increments that you don't overextend yourself and we stay within 60% of your long-term average on future contracts. So if we stay within that 60%, we know if something happens, um, there's a drought or something, we probably will be able to get to that 60%. If you want to go above that 60%, that's where our minimum price contract can come in. We have that long position, we've bought that put, but we can't, we, we can't deliver that grain. We only have to, to give that seller of that option that it, it's, it's 200 rand. We don't have to go and buy out the contract because we don't have the obligation. We have the right, but we don't have the obligation to use that, that put, but we still have to pay that 200 rand. With the minimum maximum uh, price contract, we have another problem. We have a long position. We have bought a put at the money. That's still fine, but we have sold a call now out of the money. So if the price goes up 
past our, our uh, call price, say 4,500 Rand, we go above that. Now we're open to the, and we don't have this long position. Now we have an obligation to the person we sell that call, call to. So we're going to have to buy out that grain again. So again, stay with a minimum maximum price contract, stay within that 60% of your long-term average. So you don't overextend yourself because there's nothing worse than getting into a drought. You don't have the grain to deliver that, that, that grain. And now you have to go and buy out a contract also. Because the only time a price runs away with you is uh, most of the time when there's a drought. And if you have a drought, you don't have the corn or the maize, and um, you're going to have to go and buy out that contract. So it doubles your risk. So please be very careful about that. If you do the fixed price contract and the minimum maximum price contract, also always keep in mind, don't do more than 60%. If you, if you know you have the grain, then you can do more than that. If you have any doubts, whether you're going to be able to deliver that contract, just go with a minimum price contract. You know what your risk is. Your risk is only that premium. So what can Service Invest do for you? How can we help you? We can help you manage that risk. We can look at your portfolio. We can look at your long-term average and say, listen, let's just do this percentage of fixed price contracts. It's now a time for a... Uh, minimum price contract. It's now for a minimum maximum price contract. We can help you make better pricing decisions by sending you information, letting you know when the market is favorable, um, and we can just talk you through all the different nuances of the market. Okay, what we also do for you, we carry that initial margin. What the initial margin is, if when you sell grain on suffix, you have to pay a deposit, an initial margin. And when the price moves against you, you have a variation margin, margin that you have to pay in every day to maintain that position. That Invest does that also for you. We help you execute the contracts with physical delivery to silos or directly to mills. We get you paid within 48 hours if you deliver in one of our silos. And we give you agri rewards for each ton you deliver. The main thing that we want to do is help you farm sustainably into the future. We want you to make that high price. We want you to get that 4,000 Rand. But the main thing that we want is we want you to farm next year. That's the main thing you always must keep in mind. It's, not to get that, it's, it's nice to get that high price. And we, want, we have all the tools to get that high price. But we want to get a price to farm next year. And that's the main thing. Thank you for having me here. It was a real honor to speak to you today. Um, if you need information, you, you can contact Invest anytime. We're all really there to help you. Um, and best of luck for this growing season. Um, it was been a challenging season this last season. Um, I think it, it will change this season. Um, and uh, yes, best of luck. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, it's a lot of information to take in, and this is especially important for farmers, especially when you want to move into the commercialization. So it's really, really important information. Uh, thank you so much to Neil and Senves. All this info will be on our website, and we are going to be striving to improve and update uh, the site with further information uh, with detail like this going forward. So next up, we have uh, Saral Fisser. Uh, who is from Grovation and is also uh, a farmer itself. Uh, he'll be speaking on the role of technology in strategy. Let's hear from Saro. Good day, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to discuss a little bit of tech in the agri space today. And my name is Saro Fisser. I am the managing director of the Grovation Group, but I'm also a part-time livestock farmer and therefore the awareness company has asked me to share some of my experience and knowledge with you so the focus today would really be around 
busting some myths with regards to technology in the agri space. So let's start with the most important question, and that is why do we need technology in the agri space or in our farming operations? I think the most obvious answer is that we are dealing with increasing costs and reducing resources in terms of producing food. So any of the businesses in the agri and food value chain are desperately in need for ways to produce more at a lower um, cost with the same or with less resources. And therefore technology is the best answer to help address some of these um, dilemmas. So the second important element that we have to discuss today is strategy. So now that you understand why you need technology in your farming operations or in your agri operation, I think it's important to say or to ask the question, why do I need technology at which stage? And it all comes back to what is your business strategy? So when you are a farmer, you have to remember that you're still running a business. Being a farmer is just running a different kind of business. It's uh, You still have costs, you still have revenue, you still have resources to manage, and you still have limited capital to um, spend on all of the things that you require. So therefore, the question of which technology must start with your business strategy. And you actually have to determine what your business strategy is. So let me take a practical example. If you are a farmer and you are farming uh, just because you like farming and because you like the lifestyle of farming and you like uh, living um, in the countryside, um, your strategy is gonna be way different from somebody who wants to become a mega farmer or a commercial farmer somebody who wants to um, produce uh, food in maybe more than one province or even in more than one country. And the, the role that technology will play will significantly differ. So my advice to any of the farmers out there, may you be a startup farmer, may you be a small farmer or a commercial farmer, is that before you start deciding which technology to bring into your business, you have to get clarity around your business strategy. You have to understand which um, goals you wanna achieve with your business, which, uh, what is the size of your business, how many people you're probably gonna end up employing, at what level will those uh, employees be, because the type of technology that you require to make a blue collar worker more productive varies from the type of technology that you could deploy to make a white collar um, worker productive. And so get clarity around your strategy, your business strategy, and then determine which technology would best help you achieve that strategy, achieve those goals. The third important element that I want to highlight is the different types of technology that we get. And it's not just when we talk about agri or farming, it's the type of technology that can support your business in realizing or executing your strategy. So there's two types of, broadly, two types of uh, technology. You have your management type of technology, which is very much focused around record keeping. Um, and, and, and a good example of that would be your financial systems, your financial software. But then you also have your operational technologies. And those operational technologies is really wide. I mean, it goes from something as simple as a tractor or a, a GPS tractor or any implement that uses technology to allow you to um, plow bigger fields or plow faster or manage more sheep or whatever you're farming with, um, up to software that can help you 
monitor and manage the data that is generated by these uh, various implements and probes that you might be using in your business. So what I normally see is that most farmers are, it's very, very easy for them to buy technology in the operational space. It's easy to, to buy a bigger tractor. It's easy to buy RFID um, tags for your sheep or your cattle because you can keep better a record for them. But what normally happens is that they spend a lot of money on the operational technology without having the data from a management point of view to decide which operational technology will actually help them advance the fastest or the best um, from their perspective in their business. So let's take an example. If, if you are a livestock farmer and like me, I farm with sheep. Uh, so I, I have a, my farm is uh, quite uh, large. So um, not, not that I have so many sheep, but because uh, we farm in an arid area, which means that we spend a lot of time and money monitoring our watering points. Um, it costs me almost 10,000 Rand a month just in fuel um, to monitor my watering points in summer. Now, because I have that data and I can convert that data into costs, I can see it's costing me about 120,000 Rand a year, which means that when I now go and look for operational um, technologies to solve that problem, for instance, uh, Let's take cameras. If I want to erect cameras at each of the watering points, I have a number that I now can compare that cost to. And that is where back to the two different types of technology. If you don't have a financial system or management systems to keep proper record, it's going to be very easily uh, or it's going to happen easily where you are going to make the wrong decision around the, which operational technology to procure. So, and and when we when I refer to management um, technologies, you don't always have to buy the Rolls Royce. You can you can start with a simple bookkeeping system, something that costs you two three hundred rand a month, and just make sure that you record your your data accurately. Um, because if you know what something is going to cost you, you will be able to make the do the sums to to evaluate. How much can I invest in a certain technology to actually advance my business or to uh, get a better result and to be able to manage more uh, with that technology? I think uh, the other thing about technology is that there's a lot of hypes um, that farmers have to look out for. And, and especially currently, there's the whole ACTIC hype. And a lot of them has a lot of value. But most of those uh, technologies are being created by startups themselves, which means that it's not going to be perfect from day one. And you have to, again, truly understand what the benefits are of that technology before you buy it and introduce it into your business. Otherwise, you're going to potentially end up with a lot of operational technology that costed you a lot of money, but it's not really adding any value. So maybe a few tips that uh, can help you decide, uh, other than just cost, which uh, type of technologies to look for when you look at operational technologies. So the first one that I always use is, is there a job that's being done on my farm that if I have the right technologies or tools, currently maybe two or three people are doing that job, maybe I can reduce that so that now one person can do the same amount of work or the same job as two or three people used to do. If that's the type of technologies normally that adds a lot of value to your operational site and makes you more productive. The other um, important uh, element that you have to consider is, is there any losses that you currently incur in your operations that um, by deploying this technology, you're going to ha now have the ability to reduce the amount of losses. Um, and, and sometimes 
those technologies are not even that advanced. They, they're simple technologies that can just help you monitor uh, losses or monitor um, conditions that will result in losses. If you, if you look at the um, fruit industry or um, in the crop industry, I mean, probes that detects um, the, the moisture in the soil um, will help you uh, prevent losses due to the soil becoming too dry or too wet. Because what n normally happens is you might be following an irrigation program and uh, without monitoring the, the, the moisture in the soil, you might overwater that area, which is just as bad almost to the crop as um, not giving it enough water would be. So other than costs, productivity and prevention of loss, I would say is two very important uh, elements to consider when buying technology. Then back if we look at management, I think a lot of us, especially when you're a farmer, you make a plan and you, and you figure it out and you try and uh, do it as cheap as possible, which is not, a, not wrong. But I do think sometimes management software or management technologies allows us to see things in the data that we can't necessarily see with the eyes um, or observe that closely with the eyes. Um, and and a, a good example, again, let me take my own operations. So I've started to deploy RFID tags um, for all of my sheep and especially the lambs in my feedlots. And now I have, because I use the RFID tags, I now have the ability to actually weigh my lambs weekly and calculate daily gain rates uh, for each lamb. So I no longer work with a group of lambs. I now start to work with individual lambs, which means that I can um, remove a lamb that is not performing with from the group and increase the, the group's performance, but maybe uh, take that lamb to the market um, because I can already see it's not it's not giving me the um, feet conversion ratio that I'm looking for. So those are the type of management tools that's available that will help you make decisions that you maybe currently have to do on a on a group level or on a bulk level, and it will allow you to take it down to an individual level. Something. A similar example is just taking your normal accounting software and adjusting it to give you the answers. A, a, a good example is, especially if you maybe have um, multiple vehicles or implements um, on your farm, simply keeping record per vehicle or per implement, per tractor, per um, trailer, per plow, whatever, the reparations, that amount of reparations that you spend on them. So back to cost, you will then be able to get an accurate costing that will help you to, to be able to determine if you need to buy a new tractor or a new plow rather than continuing to repair this one. So yeah, so I think my time is basically up and uh, I don't want to... Um, labor the point, but I think it's important to really understand your business before you start buying technology. And then you need to make sure that the technology that you buy is not just a cool technology, but it's actually going to help you save costs, increase your productivity or reduce losses. Thank you very much for the opportunity to the awareness company team and uh, happy farming. Great insights by Sarul. Thank you so much for contributing and sharing your experiences uh, with us today in our webinar. Uh, now I'm joined by a fantastic panel of data and agri experts, and we're going to delve more into everything about what we've been talking about today. Don't forget to post your questions, leave comments in the chat box uh, going forward. So welcome everyone uh, to our webinar, Time to Grow Precision Farming with Data. It's really great to have all of you here uh, with us today. Uh, so we have Estelle Luber, 
uh, who's also my co-founder, and she heads up our customer experience at the awareness company. We have Praveen Dwarika, who is from uh, Lamang uh, Agricultural Services, the managing director, involved in training and development of new era farmers. Uh, we have uh, Mbali Mwoko, a founder and CEO of Green Terrace, and the CEO of Ukayano, Ukanyo Farmer Development, uh, an NPO based in the Eastern Cape. And finally, we have uh, Asif Valley, who's the National Technology Officer at uh, Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft needs no introduction. Uh, so the reason we have such a diverse and wide panel with us today is that um, data is used by everyone across the agricultural value chain, whether it's technology companies, whether it's farmers, we're seeing NPOs, uh, companies that are servicing farmers as well. Data is becoming more on the topic, how do I use it, uh, where do I get it, who do I go to to help me um, with it. So across the value chain. So starting with you, Asif, um, can you tell us a bit about Microsoft involvement in the agricultural sector in South Africa and why has Microsoft undertaken uh, these programs? Great, yeah, no, thanks so much. Uh, so we are a little company in Seattle, so not a very big one. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so in 2020, Microsoft announced an investment uh, of around 40 million rand into the South African agricultural sector. And the intention behind the, this was obviously looking at the importance of agriculture in South Africa and its ability to grow jobs and create uh, opportunities for South Africans. Uh, which we thought this was important enough to be able to focus on the segment. Our aim, obviously, is to drive sustainability. We, we think that, you know, when you look at smallholder farmers in South Africa especially, uh, sustainability is an important part of what they need. Uh, and the use of technology to enhance that is one, way, one of the ways we believe we can create a, a positive impact in terms of how we, how we look at that. So the investment is really to, gear, to garner towards technology and enable uh, to be able to address that. So coming back then to, you know, as part of that investment that we made, one of the reasons uh, we looked at it was how do we look to appoint technology partners to, in order to be able to enable that. And this was where we appointed uh, the awareness company as a company that obviously was going to be the beneficiary of the agri-tech program that Microsoft was going to run. And the partnership obviously is intended to be able to develop solutions, or at least at least three solutions or high impact solutions that we believe will be able to address the, the cause of, uh, of farmers in South Africa and help them support that uh, going forward. One of the reports that we, that, we, that we based a lot of our research on was a, re, was a report called ICT or Research ICT Africa, which focused around digitization of agriculture in South Africa. And what that showed us was that obviously technology can have an impact on, 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 this, on this very important part of our ecosystem uh, in the country. When we look at technologies like IoT, remote sensing, uh, unmanned vehicles, and so on, has a direct impact in terms of the productivity and the capability of farms to be able to actually improve that. So if you take that, uh, the investment was really there to make it real and to be able to partner with technology partners to be able to do that. So we hope that that together with obviously uh, the partnerships that we've created here will be able to bring that to value. Yeah. 100% Asif, and I mean, that's fundamentally what this webinar is about as well. So uncovering all of those technologies and how do we use that data now? Uh, so thank you to Microsoft uh, for that uh, trust in the awareness company going forward. Uh, Praveen, um, Lamang Agricultural Services at the moment, you know, being one of the recipients of uh, benefits of the program that we are running now, uh, thanks to Microsoft itself. Can you tell us a little bit about the Lamang experience working with the farmers and especially what are the challenges that they are facing? Yeah, so maybe if I could start with the challenges. So, so one of the big challenges that farmers generally face is access to markets mm -hmm. and reliable access to markets. But if you take that a step back, from a, if you look at it from a buyer point of view, you want to you want to get consistency of supply. So you want to make sure that your farm can consistent, consistently supply produce of the quality and quantity that your market wants. In order to do that, you've got to know your geographical area well well enough. At farm level, moisture levels, uh, nutrient levels, um, wind speed and direction at any one point in time. Are you overwatering? Are you underwatering? Those types of factors. So what we saw with the with the information provided um, from uh, the data collected uh, 
uh, with this with soil moisture sensors, for example, and and measuring wind speeds, farmers were able to more accurately determine how much water they need to use, how much nutrients they needed to supply, and in that way, uh, they're able to now have that comfort of knowing that they can supply their off-takers in a reliable way, in a sustainable way, and definitely with a key focus on quality output. And I think that's a one big benefit that we got out of this was having that quality output. Um, you know, farmers were very much dependent in, in the area that we're talking about where they relied on the informal market. But in order for them to make that next, next leap to genuinely commercialize, this was a fantastic tool and an opportunity for them to take that leap. Excellent, excellent. And Estelle, I mean, you, you on the ground, uh, being our experience officer, um, you engaged and you've been to the Lamang farmers uh, many times. What's your current view, insights and experiences? What sort of feedback have you been getting from deploying the technology? Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I mean, the feedback from the farmers have been excellent. Um, they've been using Hydra, um, logging all of their data. Um, and not only that, um, some of the sensors and devices that we've deployed have really have a tremendous um, impact on the farm. So just a, a, a quick example, we deployed a camera trap um, on one of the farms. Um, and we actually just deployed it on someone's house just to show them what it does and how it works. And literally the next day it caught someone um, trying to steal um, copper. And because the camera trap alerted them and they were able to stop this person, since then the news has spread as well and they actually haven't had any attempts on the farms yet. Um, and something, I mean, we couldn't have asked for, <laughs> for it to, to play out better because there, there were no damage and the technology worked. But something like that just shows farmers as well how technology can play a role on their farms. And um, I think also what is important, um, uh, some insights that came out from the Lamang farmers were the, the need to keep track of their finances. Um, they need to keep track of their finances easily, not only to just know what their profits will be, but also to actually know how much money they need to save to grow their farm so that they can get to that commercial farming stage. Um, and I think those are the two main points that I would want to highlight. Awesome. Um, Estelle gave us some great examples of how Hydra specifically is helping you know, smallholder farmers, but Hydra's goal is also to help agricultural organizations managing and helping smallholder farmers. So in Bali, one such program is with Ukanyo Farmer Development. Um, tell us a little bit about the goals of UFD and how you're hoping to use Agritech in the company going forward. Yeah. So, you know, our mission is quite simple, right? Is to commercialize small scale rural farmers. And what we mean by commercializing is not to take uh, a farmer who's farming on two hectares to be farming in 2,000 hectares. I mean, if we get that, uh, it's a great achievement. However, it's really to get the farmer from two tons per hectare to average about six to seven tons, right? And obviously bringing um, good proper inputs uh, to farmers who did not ordinarily have access to quality inputs. And so that's pretty much our mission. And then um, under my leadership, I have 12 agricultural graduates who are within our organizations are called mentors. But for some of those, uh, maybe could describe them as field officers and extension officers. And uh, these 12 graduates have to uh, travel across five districts in the Eastern Cape, you know, travel more than 100 kilometers a day, um, manage for this coming season now close to 2,600 farmers as opposed to 1,300 in the past season. And so data is quite critical, right, in the operations because we need to know where are these 2,600 farmers sitting at, um, the lands that they're farming on, the, the data capturing, because we also need to report back to our stakeholders to say, indeed, our farmers are reaching six tons per hectare. Um, these, these are the areas in which they're farming. And also, how do we... Um, you know, anticipate sustainability for the organization. So if we can do things like soil monitoring, soil sensing, um, uh, keeping track of the climatic conditions, because we part primarily are a grain development company. Mm -hmm. um, we, 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 f we farm in dry land. So water is a critical resource for us as well. And so we want to strategically position our farmers in areas where they will get their land 
uh, value or the return on investment as well as us as an organization as well as our clients and our stakeholders and so technology plays a critical role and then going back to the mentors it makes their job easier to monitor and capture the farmers in various districts in which we operate in. 100%. You know, one of the non-intuitive benefits of data and technology, mm. uh, and it's such a vital one, is that it helps organizations scale. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you often it, you, you try to think, okay, where can I optimize to scale? But it's actually the opposite as well. You want to know, you need to bring in other help to actually be able to scale. And uh, why I say it's non-intuitive, because you wouldn't think, okay, let me go to technology to actually help me scale. And that is one of the things that we want to really bring out here, that the scale opportunity, uh, I, often previously I've heard technology be called a force multiplier. And, and, and that is really, really true uh, in it. And we've seen that in, in, in the customers we've deployed to as well. It really helps them scale the organization. Ultimately, you know, we want to help businesses grow their revenue, grow their profitability uh, moving forward. Okay, at this point, um, let's take some questions from some of our viewers. I see that we're getting some, uh, some questions in, which is always great. Thank you so much uh, to our viewers. So, um, we have one here from a Farmer's Hope. The Suffix trading platform is good. Uh, can't we have a vegetable platform like that. Uh, Praveen, maybe some insights from yeah, you? So, so the Suffix market is, is governed by the JSE, so it's a very formalized structure, mm -hmm. um, been very useful, proven itself since inception, uh, very good price protection for both the, the, the buyers and the sellers of grain. Um, it's a little bit difficult with vegetables. Uh, you know, that's, that's a supply demand based purely. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got average price indicators. You can track them. I mean, if you go into the different, uh, uh, the Chuanay market, for example, you go into the website, you've got good price indicators. So farmers can use that, that information to determine when to best plant to achieve the best possible price. But there's no real regulation on it mm -hmm. when it comes to that. So yes, there possibly is an opportunity, but, but I think we, we're still a way away from being able to formalize a, an exchange for vegetables as such. Okay, and I think, I think why questions like this are so great, it also helps us think. Absolutely. You know, how do we then create baselines for the future yes. uh, going forward? Um, another question is, so, you know, um, from Tumelo, I'm a new farmer just starting out. Should I implement Agitech from the beginning or wait until my farm is running properly to get uh, technology? Estelle, some insights from you? Um, the answer is 100% from the beginning. Um, you need to have it part of your strategy. You need to have a technology strategy as part of your farming overall strategy. Um, and I think if you look at where farming is heading to, um, if you do not have that in place or start thinking about it when you start farming, um, you're going to be a step behind. You need to use technology to reduce your risk, to scale, to gain access to market, and all of the, all of the things that we've been mentioning today. Mm. Mbali, as, a, as an established farmer, what's your view on, on, on this weight? Or yeah, uh, it's a bit of a yes and no, and I think for me it's what type of technology are you deploying on your farm? Mm. You know, uh, because when you start farming, you don't want to overwhelm yourself with a lot of technology that you don't know how to use mm -hmm. and what is it that you're measuring, right? Uh, farming is a doing uh, activity. And so I believe, you know, when I say yes and no and what type, for example, if you're starting out farming, there are free apps that you could use, for example, to, to keep your records in terms of mm -hmm. this is when I planted, this is when I harvested, you know, or this is when I experienced a disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you could use, obviously, um, technologies like to get price indicators for example but hardcore system tech technologies maybe that uh, uh, I don't know depending on the structure of your farm maybe that can come in a year or two after mm -hmm. but just I think as a farmer starting out use the basics that won't overwhelm you because at the end of the day your, your core, core purpose at the farmer, as a farmer is to really monitor what you're growing or putting on the ground, right? Or even if you're a livestock farmer, it's really to monitor your asset and then let your farm tell you a story. Yeah. Go through season after season, let your farm tell you a story and then from there you identify where am I losing and where am I winning. Then you start to incorporate technology that will speak to you and in line with your farm strategy and your growth. 100% in Bali, and, and we've seen this very often, you know, you tend to jump in yeah. and want to go too big, too soon, and what happens then is your likelihood of failure is high, and then you kind of get disparaged from even using 
anything in the forward. So that's yeah. great advice. Thank you so much, Mbali. Um, having just having a look at the other questions. So Verna says, times are hard, food, fuel, everything is expensive. <laughs> are we ready as a country for 4 IR and will technology be able to make a difference? Asif, thoughts from yourself? I think so indeed, 100%. So I'm more with Estelle in, in, uh, as, uh, in the earlier question as well. I think 100% is starting early on. Uh, the reason for that is kind of the concept of learn fast, fail fast. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of the best way to do it, right? If you're not going to implement early on, and you lose that one year or two years of data and information which will help you learn fast as you go forward. So implementing and starting early, I think so definitely helps. I think so the, the question about 4IR and where we are today, I think so is, has a big weighting on any decisions that anybody needs to make. But I think so from a technology perspective, we made a lot of leaps and bounds in that yeah. space. Uh, you know, I think about technologies like TV white space uh, in being able to give access to rural areas, uh, especially now that ICASA have uh, regulated or provided the ability to do that, that provides, opens that one. Uh, we spoke about solar tech, solar energy today. So there's a lot of ability that wasn't there before, which has now come, uh, which provides it. And obviously, we look at some of the AI technologies that we talk about. Uh, you know, taking the guesswork out of what you're doing is, I think, so is going to help promote more farming in South Africa, because I think so that's the biggest inhibitor today that farmers have, or at least new farmers, is their knowledge of farming. You know, it may be very academic, it may be very theoretical, but getting into the field and actually doing something, I think, so is is a very different thing from actually working and having had that experience and knowledge. So we take the guesswork out, we give you the tools and capabilities to actually get going today. So it's not just a plow and a, it's also a technology part of that. In your case, you know, you need these kind of things that go with it uh, to make up your solution. Yeah, and I think, uh, I love what you said about the iteration, fail fast, you know, learn fast, fail fast. Um, technology isn't that daunting anymore to start in, and small and iterate. You know, it doesn't need to be this giant investment anymore. Uh, so the methodology is actually changing and data and technology availability and ease of use is actually changing. Sure. And it's just a matter from us from an agricultural uh, side to uh, take advantage of that, to leverage it at this point. And we're in a great space. So yes, times are hard and all of that, but technology can actually help us keep up to date with uh, fast changing times. Um, so. We've heard from our panelists sorry, uh, some interesting varied uses of agriculture across the value chain. Uh, now let's look to the future uh, of agriculture and technology. You know. So the question uh, I'll pose to all panelists you know, is what excites each of you about the future of technology um, in your world? Praveen, we'll start with you. Yeah, no, I mean, a young farmer sitting on my left, that gives me hope um, mm -hmm. for the sector. Um, you know, we, we, we've seen, you know, the, the older generation farmers, data has always been there. They've always been using it. But what we're starting to see now is our younger, younger farmers starting to embrace converting that to information. You know, the, the saying goes, data is the new oil. Yeah. But the way I look at it is if you turn that into information, that's rocket fuel for your business. So for me, it's always important to see how young farmers are embracing that technology. You know, and, and like Asif said as well, you know, Start with, with small components of it, build on that. And by the time you get to where you really can afford to scale up, your business is just groomed for success. So I'm very optimistic about where this, where this sector is going. 100%. And you know, the, the data oil thing is, is something that's often said. Yeah. But the actual truth of it is, what is data doing for you? Correct. Uh, it always going to come back to it. You know, there is no silver bullet magic that's going to happen. It's always ask it about what's going to do for you. Yes. And in in farming and agriculture, there's so many differences. You know, there's not one blanket thing. Uh, and Bali's farm is different. You know, from Ukanyo Farmer Development. Uh, there's this, so there's always these nuances in that data and how you actually mm -hmm. use it. So. The point is, we all must go deeper Correct. Uh, when, when we're talking about data. And Bali, thoughts uh, on the future f from you? Yeah. For me, Priyash, I'm quite excited to see um, how data is shaping technology in the sense that um, it's like getting rid of the old and bringing the new. And when I say getting the old, uh, in terms of old systems and methodologies, methodologies used, and now bringing in the new, the new is yes, new tech, new data, um, new new machinery, new equipment that could advance us from a primary level up until tertiary level. But the most part, um, 
that I'm excited about is that it, technology has brought inclusiveness and diversity into the mm -hmm. agricultural sector. I mean, before awareness company, what other company was there that was doing something similar to awareness company? Before you guys entered into the agri sector, you were in a different sector. And I believe now you're learning more about agriculture and appreciating it even more, you understand? So that's what I like about what technology is bringing in. It's bringing in new scientists, um, tech guys, uh, uh, from even for, to mechanics, you know, and going into uh, plant health and bio, whatever the, the terminologies could be. But it's just really bringing a lot of inclusiveness into the agriculture sector. And it's, it's just growing the value chain. And um, that's just what I'm excited to deal with different people with diverse backgrounds, with diverse professions and knowledge that could contribute to the success of the industry in which we love so much. 100%. And honestly, that's what excites us as well. Yeah. So, I mean, going forward, it's about the ecosystem. We want to see more yeah. technology companies yeah. uh, in this and because that actually grows the, uh, you know, the capability going forward. Um, and we've seen that in other industries. And we've also, when we started this, we felt like, okay, agriculture is a little underserved when it comes to technology. You know, uh, we want it to be at the forefront. I mean, food is at the heart of everything globally. Uh, intuitively, you think it would be. Uh, so that is the journey that we've seen uh, happen. And uh, yeah, of course, we are a company that is trying to be at the forefront of, of that happening as well. Asif, thoughts from your side uh, on the future? Absolutely. I think so. Technology is really the face of what's going to be transforming farming today in South Africa and in the world. Uh, I think so when we look at some of the technologies available today already and if you look at the, cha the challenges that we have from climate change and all the other challenges, how else are we going to deal with those things without mm -hmm. being able to bring technology to help solve some of those challenges. So I think so definitely from that perspective it's, it's at the forefront. But it's also there to be an enabler from a sustainability perspective, from a productivity perspective, from an improvement perspective. So there's so many benefits that we can see and how that does. Uh, you know, for us, digital transformation, we talk about digital transformation across industries. You know, nobody ever thought about digital transformation in farming. You know, how does one transform that? And this is what we're seeing today is very much real. How does technology help empower uh, farmers to be able to really su be successful in the space? It's, and not only that, it's also in terms of their trading, in the ability to communicate, in the ability to learn, in the ability to scale as businesses, uh, and also at the same time while they're reducing costs, increasing outputs and all of those things. So it's all the positive impacts of that. And the things that you mentioned earlier, we're already at a stage where people are c comfortable with technology. It's not that we're in an era still where we, we don't have that benefit of people being able to run from almost from day one using the technology. Start small, as we said earlier, and I think so, you know, the ability to grow quickly uh, is, is definitely there. So you have scalability and you have the ability to, to learn fast, as we said. Mm, 100% are safe. No, thank you so much. Uh, Estelle, some final thoughts from you? So I am most excited about the impact that technology will have on the sustainability of farms. I don't think it necessarily is going to level the playing fields in terms of um, across from a small farmer to a mega farmer. But I do think because you've got technology and you've got access to technology, you'll be able to reduce your risks and understand how to make a success of your business, which means that you as a small farmer can just be just as successful as a mega farmer in terms of improving your quality, um, predicting your risks, getting ready for those risks, knowing what you need to do to grow and things like that. And that is, that is my main excitement for the future. No, awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, no, thank you to the panel uh, for, for sharing some time with us today. Um, all other questions that we had on our social uh, in comments and chats, uh, we will uh, answer them on our social networks going forward. Uh, and then that's a wrap from the panel perspective, and that's also a wrap from our webinar today. Uh, thank you to the speakers, the panel guests, uh, and everyone who joined us virtually uh, going forward. We really hope that you found it insightful, uh, and we hope to do more of these going into the future. We uh, educational component on agriculture we see as a fundamental in parallel with deploying and learning and getting feedback from the farms. So. It's, it's all about the collaboration and building together with the community of farming, agribusinesses, uh, technology companies uh, going forward. So thank you everyone today for joining us again. Uh, cheers and to the future. Uh -huh.